Welcome to the uh, 2020 Minton Martin Lecture uh, that Professor Richard Miller, who is the uh, Drom Hunsaka Visiting Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics, is actually going to give. Uh, first of all, uh, this, this lecture is uh, the lecture that, that Professor Miller uh, has is named in honor of Drom Hunsaka. Uh, Drom Hunsaka was the uh, uh, initially in the, uh, what was it? it, says the Department of Naval Architecture at MIT, and then the head of, of mechanical engineering, and he helped, he set up the, uh, Depart the uh, Department of Aeronautics at MIT, and went on uh, to do uh, in the um, aer aeronautics business to do many great things. And ma many things are actually named after him. Uh, he, he was a head of uh, NACA, which is a precursor to NASA. He was head of uh, um, uh, Goodrich uh, Corporation. Uh, so very, very distinguished uh, in the field of aerospace, uh, aeronautics, and, and actually the first head of the MIT uh, aeronautics uh, department. Um, in honor of him, when he, he actually uh, uh, you know, was stepping down, um, two uh, gentlemen, uh, decided to raise some money in honor of him. And so one of them is uh, Gardner, who's the one on the, uh, um, on the left, and, and Martin, Martin of, Glenn Martin of, became Martin Marietta, and now Lockheed Martin. Uh, so they decided to set up a professorship, which is the Hunsaker Professorship. And uh, as part of that, um, they, this, they, this lecture, the Minter Martin lecture was actually named. Minter Martin was actually Glenn Martin's um, mother, which is, it was named after him. And he did that in honor of her and associated with the Hunsaker lecture. And he actually helped raise the money for it. Gardner, of course, was also very well known. He started uh, what well, the precursor to both the AIAA and also uh, what, what is now known as uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology. He actually started that magazine as well. So he was very well known actually in the business. So over the years, we've had a number of these Minter Martin lectures. Uh, Bob Siemens, uh, who was in the department, of course, as, as well as being the uh, um, deputy head of NASA, as well as being secretary of the Air Force. And many other distinguished people have given this lecture. Uh, Last year, it was Dave Thompson who started uh, Orbital uh, um, Sciences and then Orbital ATK, which has been bought by Northrop Grumman. Uh, and this year, we have the honor of hearing from uh, uh, Richard Miller. Uh, Rick was the um, uh, first, the founding president of Olin College, devoted to uh, engineering education. And engineering education is something that the Aero Department has itself made a huge commitment to in terms of the things that we have actually uh, um, focused upon. And he's gonna talk about thoughts on the future of education, lessons from 20 years of basically getting old and going and learning things about uh, engineering education. So with that, let me, let me see if, um, if uh, Sanjay, since this is jointly supported both by the Aero Department and by the Task Force 2021, Sanjay, you wanna say any fine words? Yeah, no, thank you. I just wanted to say on behalf of um, Rick Danheiser who, um, and, and myself, uh, the co-chairs of the 2021 task force, um, we're very excited. Dave Damofald and Dan Hastings reached out and, and said that we had the opportunity to also um, make this a plenary talk for this task force. And we jumped at it because I think in addition to all the other things that Rick has achieved in his life as a president, as an academic in creating a new institution, um, I think that his comments that I, I've had a preview of with respect to student agency and, st and student self-efficacy and student mental health, I think are profound and very um, will be very valuable for us to hear. So back to you, Dan, and to you, Rick. So Rick, the show is yours. And the way we'll do this is he's gonna talk, uh, please hold questions till the end and then you know, put up a blue hand and uh, we'll, we'll uh, make sure that he sees the questions. Because he, he, once he shares his screen, he can't see the questions, okay? Thank you, Rick. And forgive uh, me, Rick, I'm just gonna poke my head in here and say, just so everyone is aware, this is being recorded. Thank you. Uh, 
Terrific. Well, let me begin by thanking you uh, for this incredible opportunity. I uh, have been sitting here looking over the list of people who've given this talk in the past and wondering why my name is here, uh, trying to figure it out. Um, so many extremely well-known people, people whose books I've read as a student. Um, and then I noticed something interesting. It turns out that James Hunsaker was born in 1886 in Creston, Iowa. And then Glenn Martin was born in 1886 in Maxburg, Iowa. And since I was formerly the Dean of Engineering from Iowa, I figured that must be the reason because I have some connections with Iowa. So that must be uh, why I'm here. Um, also, um, almost not quite 50 years ago, I was living in Westgate on the MIT campus where I was an undergraduate or graduate student. So I um, have a long history and in, in in affinity and really great um, admiration for MIT. And also I have to say right off the bat, um, Olin has been successful largely because of the people we've attracted. And one of the simple strategies is to catch the apples that fall off of the MIT tree. Uh, and we have quite a few of them at Olin. Okay, so I wanna try to get through this as quickly as I can so that there'll be time for Q and A. Um, this is not going to involve any equations, all right? So um, this will be a quite a break from what is normal for this sort of talk. Um, let me begin by um, seeing if, there we go, if I can click the uh, slides on. Uh, a little bit about Olin at the beginning. Uh, it was founded uh, by the residue of, of uh, revenue that was left by Franklin W. Olin, who passed away in 1951. Um, there's a, the timeline for the school, and I want to identify the Olin partner year in 2001 as being singularly important in our understanding. In that year, for a variety of reasons, we had 15 boys and 15 girls who lived for a year in construction trailers on a parking lot while the campus was being built. They were not students. They did not get course credit. They were partners as we managed to try different sorts of experiments along the way. Things that you can't normally do at a place like MIT because they were designed to fail for the specific purpose of watching it fail so we could learn from the experiences that the students had. Um, Mr. Milas was the uh, president of the Olin Foundation who decided to devote $460 million to starting over only a few miles west of MIT. Um, he basically pointed out there's a lot of unhappiness about the way engineering is taught in those days and we needed to start over. Uh, it was an informed startup. Joseph Bordonia, who was the chief operating officer of NSF at the time, and John Prados, who was the president of ABET, were both highly influential people in the Olin Foundation's thinking and starting the school. In the founding precepts for the school is this statement, sort of the, the preamble that sets the stage for everything else. Olin College is intended to be different, not for the mere sake of being different, but in order to become an important and constant contributor to the advancement of engineering education in America and throughout the world. Translated, Olin is intended to become an education laboratory permanently. Um, so we are small and we view our role sort of as this image shows. Higher education is like this aircraft carrier in the harbor and Olin College is this little tugboat pushing 90 degrees on the bow of the ship. Now the point of the uh, tugboat is not to make the aircraft carrier follow it. That's not what we're trying to do, but to through influence doing things which are 90 degrees out of phase with what the mothership is doing to get it to reorient a few degrees to the starboard or a few degrees to the port. Um, that's what Olin has been doing. Um, to do this as a laboratory designed for that purpose, we have no tenure, we have no academic departments. Uh, every student gets about $100,000 over four years in merit-based scholarship, regardless of family resources. And everything at Olin has an expiration date, um, at least in principle. What did we learn from the Olin partner year? We learned that actually students are much more capable of independent learning than we think. Um, we should experiment more and theorize less. Uh, we see this all over the world. Engineering is not a body of knowledge. It's a process. Remember, uh, the aircraft industry was built by two bicycle mechanics from Ohio. It didn't come out of a physics lab at Berkeley. Um, working in teams um, can create a momentum of learning. Collaboration is really fundamental. Focusing on problems that matter, 
Learning in context and collaborating in teams can build both confidence and a mindset, which I'm going to come back to in a minute. And none of this is really limited to the field of engineering. It's just as true of undergraduate education in any other field. And the thing that occurred most prominently to me in watching these kids during that first year, an engineer is a person who envisions what has never been and then does whatever it takes to make a better world. The important thing here is it begins with vision, not with mathematics. I think we get that backwards sometimes. Let me give you a, a quick example of a signature course in the middle of the program, one which we adapted from what many other universities attempt to do with design thinking. <clears throat> this is called UOCD or user oriented uh, collaborative design. It's human centered, begins with people and ends with people. I wanna say a little bit about innovation, uh, creativity and, and uh, the language, at least that I use to describe this is the process of generating original ideas and insights some of which can be hallucinations. Invention is the process of generating original ideas and insights that have value. And innovation is the process of generating original ideas and insights that have value, and then implementing them in ways that change the way people live. If you don't do the implementation part, it's just an idea, and there are plenty of those. Try Google and you'll see. Um, we try to build empathy and intrinsic motivation, to build agency and initiative as a natural act for all students. And an outcome should be purpose as a result of changing lives. Um, so I won't go through the case in this, uh, this particular example to save time, but we could come back to that if there's interest. Um, in order to share what we're doing with others, we have this organization which we call the Collaboratory. Um, the Collaboratory is the outward facing um, in influence that Olin has and all of our faculty understand that that is part of the purpose of Olin, it's not a distraction. This is just a tiny fraction of the institutions who have been uh, through the school, taken notes, visited, sometimes collaborated in large ways, sometimes just visited. Since 2010, we've hosted 2,500 visitors from more than 800 universities in 50 countries. Um, now, let me move on to the meat of the talk, which is about observations. Um, I think if you, look at the future of education from a, in a broad sense, globally, you can see that as time has progressed, education has changing in an important way. First was the concept of a knowledge economy, going out of the um, agrarian to the industrial to the knowledge economy, it depends a lot on knowing things. So education for 100 years or more has been about putting content knowledge into kids' heads. That's done most efficiently by having somebody who knows something, in other words, they have a PhD standing on stage and they talk about things. Um, people are arranged in rows and seats with blackboards and you know they know something because you give them a test and it's all about what you know. So you might think of this, I mean that the world would be stunningly successful with this if we had a giant Jeopardy game, you know, a game that you watch on TV um, with every person in the world having a clicker and you ask them questions and they can click to get the answers when it's right. But you know, there's a problem with this. It's called Google. Uh, while you are in fact answering the question, somebody who knows nothing about the subject can get the answer before you do by Googling it, which changes everything. Now the intrinsic value of having immediate access to information is not what it used to be. Um, now we're switching to the maker economy where it's more complicated. You still put things in, um, but there has to be stuff that comes out of kids at the same time. Organization of knowledge is completely different. This is now about a guide on the side rather than a sage on the stage. The role of teachers has changed. They're more of a coach now than the source of all information. The best organization for young people is not in rows of seats, but in small groups doing maker projects. They might be making a robot. They might be writing a book. You know, life is a maker project. And the idea of understanding how to adapt and develop things on the fly is the most fundamental need of an educated person today. It's not about what you know, it's about what you can do with what you know. This is well underway. I think in the last 20 years, I've seen project-based learning pop up on almost every corner of the planet. Um, people are beginning to migrate coursework that way. But this is not the end. I think the innovation economy demands something different. Now it's about what comes out of kids' heads more than it is about what you put in. We're not really sure how this happens, but I'm quite sure 
that the classroom that of the innovation economy looks more like a kindergarten than it does a class uh, in a graduate course in mathematics. It's no longer about what just about what you can do, it's about what you conceive. Creating people with original ideas and insights is the gold standard. And none of this is new. Uh, Yeats pointed out that education is not the filling of a pail which happens on the top left, but the lighting of a fire which happens on the top right. Education must change now and it must change pretty rapidly. And we're beginning to get a very personal view of that with the pandemic. Um, there's been a change in world population over all history. As you can see, a rather sudden change. It looks like a hockey stick. Suddenly around 2000, around, around 1900, excuse me, we see this explosion in population. Um, this coincides with the industrial and technological revolution. In fact, in 1900, the, the average lifespan in the US was in the mid 40s. But in 2000, the average lifespan is in the late 70s. Um, technology has an important uh, role in this. So we celebrate that we have changed uh, life for the better for humans uh, through technology. But there is another side to this. It turns out population biologists have seen graphs like this. This is what happens when the predators are gone and the rabbits explode in the population in the outback in Australia. So um, this could have a downside. Within a generation, we could be extinct because we don't manage our lives uh, in ways that, that uh, coincide with the reality of the limitations of our planet. So this is also an existential threat and we have to educate in a new way. The NAE Grand Challenges, for example, um, in 2008 were developed for just this purpose, to begin to look at what it is, the big problems in front of us that need to be addressed in order to make sure that the next generation has a secure future. Um, this is not just the NAE's work, also the Sustainable Development Goals from the UN, which have high overlap. These kinds of problems are different than the problems that we have faced in the past, and it requires a different kind of education. These are global, complex, multidisciplinary challenges. They don't fit neatly into disciplinary boundaries. Problems of sustainability, which I think are probably the best understood, have to do with um, global climate change, for example, which you read about in every day's newspaper. Um, when we used to give this talk 10 years ago, everybody understood sustainability, and they just kind of the eyes would glaze over when you talked about health and security and so on. But maybe you've heard of the pandemic. Uh, global health may be even more urgent than, than uh, sustainability. And cybersecurity is a major concern. Um, I know the Defense Department has been worried about that since 2012 when I did some work at, the, at West Point. Uh, enhancing life. Maybe you know something about the Black Lives Matter movement and the concern about equity and inclusion. This is what happens when you look at this, this um, graph of human population and you think about how you distribute the resources when things get really scarce. So we need a new kind of education for the 21st century that creates innovators. But it turns out that a traditional approach to higher education may actually be preventing us from producing the innovators that we need. Um, lots of things that are written out this. For example, let me talk about this insight um, this could be a map of a large campus. Let, let's pick on Michigan, for example, just because it's large. Um, they have a quad for engineering that's maybe two miles from the, uh, the library in the center of campus. Uh, and if you major in engineering at Michigan, you will spend most of your time in the engineering quad, maybe 75% of it. Because ABET, the accreditation board, requires that engineering students get 75 of their credit hours in science, math, and engineering, and only 25% in anything else. So why would you move? It's a long ways away. By the way, over in the green circle is the business school. Um, and you might think of the, the red circle as being where the liberal arts students hang out. Now, it turns out if you study engineering uh, and you sit in the back of the room and you listen to the kinds of things that you are learning, there's a bias to it. Almost everything that we teach is about feasibility. We teach you what you can do, what's possible to do based on natural law. Is it physically feasible? On the other hand, across campus in the business school, students are studying business and the AACSB requirements require that half of all the credit hours you take be in management, accounting and, and marketing and so forth. It's about viability there. Almost everything that you do 
is about what's financially viable. Uh, so what goes on in the liberal arts area where people are studying psychology, arts, and humanities? It's about desirability. The kinds of questions that you ask in that circle are fundamentally different. They're questions like, what is the meaning of love? What is the meaning of justice? What is the meaning of truth? What is the meaning of beauty? These are not questions that are answered with vectors and calculus or with spreadsheets, but they determine human motivation in the most fundamental way. Now, the reason this is interesting is because if you look at the process of innovation, um, the process of generating original ideas and insights that have value, and then implementing so they change people's lives, every innovation that you can think of is simultaneously feasible because nothing happens. It isn't consistent with natural law and also viable because it has to generate enough revenue to justify its existence, but it fundamentally must be desirable as well. Um, I didn't really understand this until I spent 18 years on the board at Babson College, which is a business school. It's right next to us. Uh, they talk about innovation all the time, um, but they hardly have science in their curriculum. Um, and I, you know, was really annoyed. Maybe I'm being punished for some sins in a former life, I don't know. Until it occurred to me, maybe innovation doesn't only happen because of a Nobel Prize and some new gadget that a person invented in their shop. Um, have you heard of the credit card? Do you think that changes the way people live on the planet? Maybe it's possible to generate an innovation that changes life on the planet without having physics at the heart of it. Maybe it's more complicated than that. And by the way, Facebook, what does Facebook sell? Um, Facebook fundamentally exists because of, I think, Maslow's law, the psychologist who said the most important thing in every person's life is to be the most important person in another person's life. And that's incredibly difficult to do. Um, and it turns out that Facebook's promise is that they will allow you to share what matters to you in the most creative way, in the most revealing way with people that you care about. Okay, so what can go wrong with that? I understand. Uh, no amount of emphasis on narrow specialized courses will produce the innovators we need. You need in one head, all three of these ideas simultaneously. So we need to rethink about the fundamental structure of our undergraduate education program. By the way, 21st century innovators need more than knowledge. It turns out attitude plays a huge role. And more often than not, your attitude determines your altitude in life, not your aptitude. Now this is, this is one of those things like a fish in the water that can't see the water inside the bowl. Um, we have in higher ed for so many years worshiped the people who are the smartest person in the room who is most likely to come up with new scientific discovery first and win the Nobel Prize. So we become proud of that. And in fact, somewhat arrogant. Um, arrogance is an attitude, be careful. Um, as Norm Augustine, who's a person I think everyone in, on, in the aero department knows, said in Aviation Week and Space Technology in 2016, motivation almost always beats raw talent. It's not just about how smart you are. Um, there's been numerous studies on attitudes, behaviors, and motivations, which I'm calling mindset. Uh, as you can see, IBM has been talking about the T-shaped individual for a generation. STEM Connector, a group of 200 corporations put together a blueprint for the education of the 21st century, which begins with employability skills, which has more to do with attitudes and mindset than it does with competence in math and AI. There are five basic mindsets that you see as you read across these studies, a collaborative mindset, a person who would rather not eat alone with somebody who is not in the same department and doesn't even look at things from the same way, an entrepreneurial mindset, which is a person who basically envisions what has never been and does whatever it takes to make it happen, takes initiative, an interdisciplinary mindset, which I think is a problem we create with our, our view of what matters in higher ed about uh, discipline specific uh, specialized knowledge, a global mindset, which is a particular problem for uh, students in the US and an ethical mindset, which are now we're beginning to see in spades um, is a problem when technology empowers even a small number of people to change the world. Now it's not about whether you can do it, it's about whether you should do it. And we don't, we're not really well prepared as a society and in our educational models to deal with those questions. It's not just about content knowledge anymore. So let's think about this mindset thing. Can, can that be defined? Can it be measured? 
um, what about this? It turns out when I first sort of ran into this material, I got a little bit nervous. Um, mindset. That sounds like the latest fad that you can get a self-help book in the airport. Um, but I ran into Carol Dweck. Uh, do, you, do you know who Carol is? Uh, she's a professor of psychology at Stanford. Um, she, is, she won the Atkinson Prize at the National Academy of Science for her work. She's been studying largely K-12 for 25 years and found that a very simple idea has a profound impact on the way kids learn, what they believe about themselves. It turns out if you believe that your intelligence is key to learning and most all success in life, because we think so highly of smart people, uh, then it's something that you inherit from your parents and apparently it's deterministic. So the world is flat. And if you push yourself too far away from your comfort zone, you could fall off because guaranteed there are things that you're not capable of doing or learning. That's called a fixed mindset. You believe that your intelligence and your capabilities are fixed and you better be careful not to exceed them. On the other hand, some kids believe that intelligence is more like a muscle that you can grow it by, ex by exercising and then challenging yourself. Kids who have that belief tend to grow and grow and grow and exceed their own expectations and everyone else. No, they don't all win the Nobel Prize, but they become much more competent and much greater at their capability than anyone expected. This is her result that won her the, um, the uh, Atkinson Prize. She's not the only one who's studied this phenomenon. Uh, in fact, Angela Duckworth at Penn, who's a psychologist, uh, wrote a very influential book called Grit, um, The Power of Passion and Persuasion. Uh, this is back to the comments we had just a minute ago by Norm Augustine. Turns out it's also studied in, in adults. James Heckman, University of Chicago, uh, Nobel Prize in Economics uh, for studying this phenomenon. Um, it's lots of books on it. The book that uh, to me makes it so simple is this book by Paul Tuff on how children succeed, not how they learn. What he discovers is that grit is often a better predictor of success than knowledge or intelligence. Um, can you learn grit? How do you do that? How do you shape mindset? This is a picture of Mel Ramey, who was my undergraduate advisor at the University of California at Davis. Um, I was in his very first freshman incoming class as an advisee, and he and I be became friends for 40 years. Um, he also learned later in life, I learned that he's an Olympic track coach and he's had two or three of his former students win Olympic gold medals. Um, the skills that it takes to bring that kind of performance out of people are closer to what we need to be doing in education right now than writing another paper for journal publication. What I learned from Mel, I learned hopeful faculty members spread hope among their students while cynical faculty members spread cynicism. You've never met a cynical faculty member, have you? Um, turns out you probably never met a cynical entrepreneur because that's an oxymoron. Um, entrepreneurs have to believe in a better future and they have to believe that they could take the initiative to make it happen. You can't do that if you're cynical. By the way, Professor Howard Gardner at Harvard, um, the same guy who, um, who won the MacArthur Prize for his study of multiple intelligences years ago, just completed a seven year study of the future of college. Uh, 2000 interviews on 10 campuses studied in depth well before COVID. Key findings, the number one concern on all of these campuses is not student debt, it's not political bias, it's not corruption in admissions, it's belonging. Students are really concerned about belonging and about whether they're going to succeed and meet people's expectations, including their own. This is followed very closely by mental health. Uh, it's not just in engineering, mental health is an issue in medicine too, in medical schools all over the country. Um, now let's switch gears and talk a little bit about what have we learned in the last six months from the COVID experience and how can we take that learning forward to talk about the future of education that must go uh, beyond this? Well, number one, learning is not a place. It, it's not in a classroom, it's an activity and you can do it anywhere. Um, remote learning can be very effective. Um, the trick is engagement. Uh, it has to be not watching a movie, but it has to be having a conversation like you would with a telephone call. But remote learning poorly addresses social and emotional objectives. Um, belonging and teamwork, for example, um, can be really difficult to generate. So let me just read um, a few words about remote learning in this COVID era written by Angela Duckworth about two weeks ago. 
And I think she gets the point across of why this doesn't scale as simply as you think. Quoting now, my experience teaching remotely has convinced me that humans are built for human relationships. We don't mind buying paper towels on our browsers, but there is no one click equivalent to feeling understood, respected and cared for by another person. The most rewarding part of my life with students is not when I'm clicking through my slides, doing my best to look directly at the webcam and speak cl with clarity into the microphone. What I really look forward to each week are my office hours, which I intentionally designed to be one-on-one. -on -one. During these brief conversations, my students share what's on their mind, their questions, their worries, and what do you think of about this ideas? I tell them that what I'm thinking and feeling too and apart from taking place by video call, it's as basic a human interaction as you can imagine. And yet it's magical. More and more, I'm getting to know my students as people and they're getting to know me too. Now research suggests that healthy interpersonal relationships share three essential elements. The first is understanding, seeing the other person for who they are, including their desires, their fears, their strengths and their weaknesses. The second is validation, valuing the other person's perspective even if it differs from your own, maybe especially if it differs from your own. And the third is caring, expressing authentic affection, warmth, and concern. So while it may be easy to put up um, a webinar uh, for the class on Tuesday, you can't easily deal with the issues of building relationships, human relationships with the students, which are really important. Making and building online, um, building, uh, online presents significant challenges. So Olin, like MIT, expects kids to be able to do something with their education when they leave. Not being able to get into the shop, not being able to share tools with someone else uh, is a significant challenge. And I think it's gonna be a while before we get really successful ways of managing that. And of course, access to reliable quality online resources today really amplifies inequality. If you are teaching online today, you know that your students are all over the planet. Some of them have a lot of noise and distraction going on in the other room. Even getting access to a computer can be a real challenge. So that's some of the lessons learned from COVID, but that's not probably the most important ones. I think it's not just about online learning. What COVID and the reaction to COVID globally has shown us is much deeper. The need for critical thinking, have you heard anything about conspiracy theories these days? Some of which sound like they're from a comic book and yet they're widely believed. Almost every college president in the fall will lead a convocation in which they tell you our primary purpose is to provide you with critical thinking so that this will serve you well for the rest of your life. I think we may need to reevaluate how well we're doing with critical thinking given the way the country is going. By the way, the importance of truth, the basic notion that facts matter is, is under attack now in a way that I had never imagined possible. Answers like, well, a lot of people agree with me when given as evidence of your argument um, will not cut it. If you're designing an airplane, you better get the equations right. By the end of the run runway, um, people will die if you made mistakes. It, truth matters. Finally, there's a disregard for science and for scientific process. Um, incredible, and this matters. What about trust in vaccines? How are we gonna do this if people don't believe science? And of course, there's unprecedented public disapproval of all of higher education in the US today. Um, there's anti-elitism. There's a concern that paints with a very broad brush across all higher education that affects the federal investment in education it infects what our children are going to be exposed to. All of this was brought to light in the last six months through the COVID experience. We can only imagine what it'll be like in five years. Now, which makes me think about trying to set a model for positivity of where we need to be going. Uh, how do we find the right answers? Turns out in 2014, Gallup and Purdue teamed up to do the largest survey of alumni in history. It's called the Gallup Purdue Index. About 100,000 now uh, surveys of alumni have taken place. And it's a simple correlation study. What's your life like today, 20 years after you graduated, for example, versus what were your experiences as an undergraduate? Um, turns out that, they, that Gallup for a long time has had something called their well-being index. Like 80 or 90 years they've been doing this. It's used to determine which country on average has a higher 
level of happiness among their population than others. It's five dimensions. So one of it has to do with financial, but it's much broader. Um, this is written up in a lot of places, a very accessible um, summary of the results is in this trusteeship magazine from a couple of years ago. What did they find? Um, they didn't find, by the way, I was a little bit disappointed as an engineer, that taking courses in free body diagrams changed their world for better. Um, nothing that happened. Instead, they found two things that happened. Someone cared about me as a person. And college is not just about books and tests, it's about life. I had an opportunity to engage with real people in ways that could change their lives while I was still an undergraduate. If that happened, and if that happened in, in a way which I strongly agreed with in the survey, it turns out it doubles your sense of success and well being in life doubles, which is quite significant. Of course, the bad news is only 3% of alumni strongly agree with this. But the good news is, with a little bit of effort, we could double that to 6%. Um, there is an opportunity here. We could make some progress on this. Um, by the way, let me return real quickly to that UOCD course that I, that I brushed by early on, this course about design education that's human-centered. Let me carry you through a simple example of teaching design, which addresses these concerns right up front. Um, in this particular course, which all students at Olin are required, and maybe other universities too, we put them in small groups and we ask them a simple question on the first day. Identify a group of people whose lives you want to change. Not someday, but in the next four months. Uh, and then we just listen. So to give us some context, I'll walk you through a, a slightly um, edited version of a real case study. So this one young lady says, my grandmother is in assisted living now. She has Alzheimer's. We went to visit her at the holidays and her life is all different. I'd like to do something to improve the lives of the elderly. So we said, terrific. Uh, we'll find 10 elderly people within a 10 minute drive of campus who live in assisted living. And what we'll do is have you interview them for two hours each in the first couple of weeks. So in the first two weeks, they do 20 hours of structured interviews with people in a nursing home um, who are uh, struggling with the changes in their life. Of course, this is aided by having um, an anthropologist on our team who's really good at dealing with cultural surveys. They come back with a lot of uh, sticky notes that have detailed um, uh, observations, things like, well, um, my worst fear is somebody uh, in my neighborhood here on the, on the same floor, fell down and broke a hip. And it didn't heal. And now they're confined to a wheelchair for the rest of their life. And by the way, what that means to me as a resident here is that I no longer can look people in the eye. When they come, I can only look at their belt buckle and they have to look down on me. Um, it's a psychological thing. And when they come to visit, they congregate in groups over my head and they talk about me in the third person and I'm no longer a person. I'm now a problem that they need to solve. Um, I don't want to go there. Oh, and by the way, um, I can't walk. And so I can't burn calories. And so I can't control my weight. And even finding out what I weigh is a big issue. So the kids come back after these 20 hours and they have these sticky notes on the wall with little quotes that they've heard and arrange them in themes. And they're talking about what can we do about it? Because they have to, in the course, they have to come up with two or three ideas that would change these people's lives. And they said, I don't think we can solve the aging problem today. Um, we're only 19 years old, but maybe we can do something about this weight thing. What if, and they begin to brainstorm, what if we just imagine building a little carpet with pressure sensors under it and RFID radio transmitter that would send data to your iPhone that is an app that would remove automatically the tear weight of the wheelchair and tell you exactly what you weigh. Um, what if you could do that? Uh, would that matter? So they came back to the same 10 people with this list of ideas and they told them about this carpet thing and their faces just lit up and they said, can you really do that? And they said, well, we don't know, but we think we can. So um, let us go back and try. Uh, they came back to campus and they were on fire. Okay, they had not had any courses in, in data transmission on, on uh, through the radio. Um, they didn't know anything about pressure sensors and, they said, who on this campus knows anything about that? I wanna go have lunch with them. I wanna find a book about it. I wanna experiment with it. In a few months, they built one. Now they have a prototype. The next course in the curriculum, how to start and run a business. Okay, now they have a client group. They have a prototype. They, all they need to know is what are the price points? Can you manufacture this thing? 
they entered the, the business plan competition across the street, at Babson College. They happened to win, come home with $10,000, and they start a business in their residence hall. Um, it's called lily pad scales. You can still buy them to this day. Now, this is not the only, everybody doesn't do that project. They do a different project that each student team uh, generates, but they have those same characteristics I mentioned before. Why am I mentioning that here? First is this, you can't spend 20 hours of structured interviews in a nursing home with people who are struggling with this change in their life without building a sense of empathy. It changes your identity. You're 19 years old and you're sitting in a nursing home for two weeks. Um, this tends to, to change who you are. The business of going home without a course and, and figuring out a way on your own by taking initiative to build a prototype builds agency. So identity and agency. And the last thing is when you come back to them and you show them this prototype that would actually change their lives and you see the joy on their face and you're only 19, you don't have a degree yet, this changes your sense of purpose. You can see it in them. There's a visible change in their attitude, um, identity, agency, and purpose. And what we know from Gallup is this is the kind of thing that changes outcomes 20 years later. By the way, student debt, um, rising tuition, political bias on campus, corruption in admissions, and in fundraising, many, many issues are a major cause for public concern about higher education today, writ written large. Not necessarily MIT, uh, but about the whole industry of higher ed. <clears throat> I came on this, came across this documentary film a couple of years ago, which I highly recommend. It's primarily about public higher education, but it exposes the, mo the movement that's well underway in the US for governance in public education to be very demanding, very restrictive. Um, in fact, the whole title of this is Starving the Beast is intended to send the message that the legislature is going to cut off funding for the state university and let it collapse and rebuild it so that it becomes a more effective job training issue. Uh, can, and, it's, and it's got examples. The presidents of the flagship research university at six major states in the country have been terminated in the last few years because of this kind of an initiative. What do we do to set a positive example going forward? Turns out higher education, if you poll people in the streets, is not known for our commitment to student well-being. Uh, we're known for our commitment to trying to win the Nobel Prize and to building our endowment. We think that the rest just sort of automatically flows, um, but the rest of the public doesn't agree. We're known for um, the wrong things. The public is losing confidence in us and we need to start paying attention. We must become known once again for our fundamental mission, transforming lives through education. I wanna tell you now, we're almost through with this, um, about a new initiative that is very nascent that I've been involved in, a number of my colleagues have been in, involved in, a Coalition for Life Transformative Education, which is built on the realization of what Gallup showed. It's not just about content knowledge anymore. We need to take responsibility for shaping the mindset of the young people that we have as well. First off, to be healthy, but then to be innovative and to make an impact that matters in the world too. A good education changes what you know, but a great education changes who you are. We need to focus on identity, agency, and purpose, the substrate below the calculus class that makes it possible for every student to succeed. College should be the doorway to a flourishing life, not just a job. We need to aim higher, not lower. Um, a growing number of like-minded national university leaders working to pioneer new models for higher education that scales to all students in the country. That's the idea. Now, here's the list of the institutions that are currently working with us. Now, the presidents and the provosts of all of these institutions have been meeting every six months or so for the last few years, piloting now new projects that could change education and scale to other institutions. So let me just uh, point out, for example, the University of Connecticut, whose president is an engineer, uh, Tom Katsoleas, who uh, was the former provost at uh, University of Virginia, has a strategic plan. Uh, one of the three key pillars in the plan is building life transformative education for every student in the state. Um, University of Michigan at Dearborn is doing something similar. University of Southern California has an initiative that touches identity, agency, and purpose for large numbers of students. Um, 
I want to just give a quick plug in two minutes to a project that isn't yet part of the coalition, but I've learned about at the University of Vermont. It's called the Wellness Environment. It's an opt-in residence hall where students have to sign a contract to get in. There is uh, an, an agreement not to use any substances, no alcohol, no tobacco, no marijuana, nothing. You can do that in some other residence hall. You need to um, commit to taking a course in neuroscience and human development, which shows that how you use your brain as a teenager in particular determines how you build your brain, uh, the neurons wire in that way. Um, it turns out you have to also commit to 30 minutes of cardiovascular exercise every day and eat the healthy food that they provide in the residence hall. You have to commit to 30 minutes of yoga and keeping a journal about gratitude. You have to write down every night three things that you're grateful for. Um, when Jim Hudziak, the physician that started this, went to the provost and asked for permission, the provost looked at him like he was from another planet. And he says, you know, we're actually known for being a party school. Nobody's gonna do this. It's been a few years now, about 1200 students are in this residence hall and there's a waiting list to get in. There's been a stunning improvement in not only well-being but in academic performance of the kids. This is what I mean about identity, agency, and purpose. We need to do more of this and I'm hoping even MIT will think about uh, maybe joining this group. But that last slide, a uh, quote from Chuck Vest, who was a mentor to all of us and was quite close to us at Olin as well. Making universities and engineering schools exciting, creative, adventurous, rigorous, demanding, and empowering milieus is more important than specifying curricular details. I think he said it very well. And with that, um, I will end this and, um, and return to answer questions, if anybody's still awake. Yeah, yeah, so Rick, that, that was a great presentation. Thank you very much for it. It, it, it makes us all think, I, I'm sure, Sanjay and Tim and the task force are thinking about it, certainly in the Aero Astro department, we'll think about it. So let, let's open it up to questions now. Can please put up a blue hand that I will call upon you. Okay, oh, uh, Sanjay. Uh, I, I just wanna kick things off, um, Rick. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, the pursuit of purpose, is it projects? What's the general, what's the bigger how does one do that beyond projects? Uh, purpose, of course, uh, is different for different people. It's, uh, but I, in almost every case that I'm aware of, it has to do with you making a difference in someone else's life. Um, it turns out, by the way, that, that among the differences in the way you see purpose, um, we found a correlation between doing things that help people and doing things that attract female students. Um, it turns out that, that um, this is something that you know at MIT, what is the department that has the highest percentage of females in engineering? I'll bet you it's biomedical, it's environmental, and it's chemical. Um, I'll bet it's not electrical and it's not mechanical. That's not um, true either, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Or, or an arrow probably too. Right. Um, this, this is, I think, not an accident, and I think it relates to being uh, involved in helping people. And, you know, when you're 18, it's hard to be satisfied that when I'm 26 and I have a PhD, then I can begin to help people. You see the same problem in medicine. Uh, people go into medicine in order to help people. Uh, on the other hand, you, you get the medical degree and then you have to do a fellowship afterwards to become specialized. You don't really start your career until you're in your mid 30s. There's a great deal of dislocation of a sense of uh, achievement and purpose in that, uh, which needs to be addressed as well. Thank you. All right, Charles Dawson. Hi, so um, I have a follow up on, so you mentioned this list of qualities and that mindset aspects that it's important to um, instill in the students that are being educated. I guess I have a question about do you see similar qualities of mindset being important for the educators themselves? Is that the same set of mindset qualities or is it a larger set, a different? I'm curious about the relationship there. You know, it doesn't surprise me that one of the most insightful questions comes from someone younger uh, on the, in the group who's been who's close to the uh, educational process. Um, it turns out, I believe you can only teach what you know. Um, if you don't have a growth mindset, you're gonna have a heck of a time teaching it. 
if you don't have an entrepreneurial mindset, you're going to have a heck of a time modeling it. Now, luckily, every student, every faculty member you have does not have to have all of these mindsets. Even the Gallup data shows that. If you go back and look at it, they are, they are interviewing people 10, 20, 30 years after they graduated. And what did they say? Somebody cared about me as a person. They didn't say everybody cares about me as a person, okay? Um, by the way, on average, it takes maybe 30 college courses to get a degree. Um, and if one of those courses had a faculty member that really followed you and resonated with you and cared with you as a person, um, that's only 3%. 3% of all the faculty that you had could make a huge difference in your life. What if 10% of our faculty really cared? Um, they, you have a safety factor built in. I think you could really make an impact. Um, and by the way, you're not going to persuade the people who are rightfully there at MIT to win the Nobel Prize. I'm not saying that that's the wrong thing to do. I'm just saying it's not enough. It's, it's not complete. I'm going to believe that MIT has way more than 10% of its faculty that already care about students and already are committed because I know I've run into a number of them in the department. I've only been here for a few weeks. Um, what we need to do is recognize that, um, build a sense of purpose for the faculty. This is not a distraction from your primary purpose. This is your primary purpose. Uh, let's mainstream this. Let's bring it in so every student at MIT has this experience and it would answer the survey the way uh, Gallup had pointed out 10, 20 years from now. And I think you can move the needle. Great, thank you. So Ed Crawley. You're muted, Ed. Great presentation and I think we're in the same time zone. Yeah, <laughs> pretty rare for us. Um, you know, you're a road warrior like I am in this, in this cause. And we've been on the road for a good 20 years, maybe 25 years with these stories and these proposals. And maybe we've gotten some traction, but uh, there are days when I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we had a year to work on this together, hypothetically, can you think of one or two things we could chip, we could do that would sort of chip away at the at the obstacles that we, we find that are preventing. You know, the signal here is overwhelming, as you know very well. The response is what's what's epsilon. Can we get to three epsilon in a year or something? I mean, what 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 could we do? What would be one or two concrete things we could do to make make a step in the right direction? Yeah. Well, Ed, you know, you and I have begun conversations along this line, and one of the most attractive things for me for spending the year here at MIT is the opportunity to work with you because we have such similar visions for the need for change in education. Um, there are a number of things. I mean, there, there are simple things and there are bold things uh, and everything in between. One of the simple things we could do, I believe, is to begin to look at the power of the grand challenges to elevate people's aspirations and their uh, willingness to make a commitment uh, in their life to make a difference. Um, sustainability, I don't think, needs to be sold anymore. This seems to be largely accepted around the planet, except in a few places in the United States, I guess. Um, it's a really important issue. Um, kids devote themselves to that. I think the uh, global health issue is catching on. People are beginning to realize that this matters as well. Um, why would this matter? Because number one, if, if you st only study things that matter, rather than things that you have to get an encyclopedia to figure out what this course is intended to do. If you only study things in context, so that that means they have a real problem in front of them. Um, if you only study things in teams, we spend so much time in higher education trying to put people in a cubicle by themselves doing a multiple choice test and telling them not to talk to their neighbor because that's cheating. Um, and yes, I understand assessment is important, but it turns out I don't know a single company that asks people to sit in a cubicle and not talk to their neighbor all day and can make money with this. It's this business of collaborating is key uh, and you only learn it by practicing it. Uh, we can figure out, they have done this in the arts for a generation. Um, we could begin to build, for example, a project at MIT that's campus-wide, that's built into the undergraduate general education requirements for every graduate at the Institute. Um, that involves understanding sustainability. 
okay? And why this has to be an important issue. You could pick any of the other ones as well, but I think that one is already sold. Um, a really bold idea, which you and I have bounced off of each other and probably won't uh, fly on the first try, uh, is the idea of rebuilding undergraduate, what it means to be educated as an undergraduate. In any discipline, I don't think disciplinary labels at an undergraduate level make a lot of sense now. They make more sense in engineering than they do in liberal arts. They still, as I'm watching the graduates at Olin take off, many of them that have a mechanical engineering undergraduate degree are going to work as coders at Google. Um, people who, who studied electrical engineering are doing things that have nothing to do. They're going into pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the labels don't matter. Um, I think your disciplinary major is like your hometown. It's where you grew up. You know where Main Street is, you know where the post office is, um, that's helpful. Uh, if you're still living you know, within two blocks of where you grew up, you probably haven't grown very much. Uh, almost all of the important things that I've done in my career are things that I was not supposed to do. People told me you're not qualified to do that. Um, that's how you grow. And I think we could do an experiment and here's the outrageous idea. What if we were to, to start an experiment at MIT um, of a small group of undergraduate students who were willing participants in this uh, to take an experimental undergraduate degree that does not have a label. We just call it a bachelor's of science at MIT. And they define what they're learning uh, by, the, by a series of 20 team-based projects that relate to important problems in society, whether, it's, whether it is um, global climate change or whether it is um, social change and social justice. Um, but at the end of their time, when they walk across the stage, they don't just present the employer with a transcript. They present them with a three ring binder with 20 tabs that have a detailed analysis of the uh, problems that they've actually solved. Um, and I am absolutely convinced those kids would have every bit of the same uh, opportunity uh, for employment that the kids who have a degree in computer science do. Uh, and I don't believe it hurts them for graduate work either. But of course, this is a theory. I haven't, I don't, no one's done the experiment yet. Um, and there are lots of things in between, Ed. Um, you know this as well as I do. There, there's easier for us to do these experiments in other countries than it is in the US. And it's time somebody in the US uh, took the lead. Okay, Rick, it's three o'clock. Thank you very much. Let me. Uh, thank you. Uh, this was a great talk and we really appreciate it. Of course, it's recorded and we will, uh, in some fashion, post this up on our, on our website after it's appropriately captured. So thank you again. Thank you.